uh, to keep this. So, uh, so yeah, Luke chapter 1, starting again at verse uh, 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, the town of Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly, greatly troubled at, the, at this, uh, his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You, uh, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Wonderful, wonderful uh, story from the life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, the early church had no trouble with this doctrine. It really never became a point of contention, really, until later, like later into the 1800s, before people ever questioned, really, the virgin birth. Um, but it's pivotal to our faith to understand that Jesus was, uh, was born of a virgin, and the thing is, it used to always be linked, if you remember, I mean, if you've ever heard before, Augustine uh, tried to link Jesus' sinless perfection from the fact that he was born of a virgin. He had no father, so he didn't have uh, that uh, nature, that sin nature passed on to him. But uh, in spite of the fact that Augustine was a brilliant man, that doesn't carry much weight because his, he still had a human mother. So he would still have... You know, the sin nature passed on. Um, but the reason why Jesus didn't is because he was born of the Holy Spirit of God. Um, in, our, uh, in our articles of faith, uh, and I just want to bring this up uh, to show you what we should be linking the virgin birth to. Uh, in our article of faith number two, it says, We believe in Jesus Christ, the second person of the triune Godhead, that he was eternally one with the Father, that he became incarnate by the Holy Spirit, was burned to the Virgin Mary, so that two whole and perfect natures, that is to say the Godhead and manhood, are thus united in one person, very God and very man, the God-man. Okay, and that's just a, a technical way of saying, look, the virgin birth has to do with the fact that Jesus is incarnate. He is God in the flesh. We need this doctrine. Our the entire way of life, our, our, our trust, our hope or everything is dependent on the fact that God came in the flesh. And so the virgin birth is how God achieved that. Um, now, there are, uh, in contemporary times, there are, you as a believer are going to come under attack for this doctrine. People think it's ridiculous. A virgin giving birth, that is just, how can you believe something like that? You know, you'll get asked about Noah and the boat. You know, oh, you believe that there was an ark that fit all those animals, blah, blah, blah. That, you know, you think we'd have bigger things to worry about. Um, but you have all the things that are questioned, miracles and signs and wonders, and people question these things, and virgin birth is one of the central things that come under attack. So you as a Christian need to know, what do I do with this? Like, how do I deal with this? We, we believe it, we affirm it. Um, but there's three major attacks you're going to come, you're going to find uh, as you deal with this uh, doctrine, as you deal with sharing the gospel with people, uh, because I think they, they, they have clever arguments, and they're not clever. I'll show you real quickly. There's a really easy way to defeat every one of these. Uh, so the first one, uh, oops, yeah, we're going to talk about three major arguments. The first is this. Uh, the virgin birth is a biological impossibility, right? It just, a virgin can't conceive. It's impossible. Um, there has to be, we know there has to be, uh, there has to be two people. There has to be two to tango. You can't have, unless you have both elements, father and mother, you can't have a baby, right? That's, they, that's, well, that's, we, we know that. Scientifically, that's proven. Uh, and, and we understand that. Do you realize that even the biblical writers realize that? Do you realize Joseph? Uh, Joseph didn't just say, oh, okay, Mary, you know, you're, you're giving birth to a baby. Wow, yeah, that's awesome. He's, no, he said, wait a minute. Takes two to have a baby. I learned my birds and bees. It takes two to have a baby, um, where's the other one? Mary must have cheated on me, right? They were betrothed, they were engaged, they were to be married, and, and Joseph, 
uh, was not just some super, superstitious primitive boob. He was an intelligent man who said, wait a minute, there is something wrong here. This is biologically impossible. And he had decided to divorce her privately, it tells us in Matthew's account of the virgin birth. So yeah, it is a biological impossibility, and we affirm that, and we accept that, right? Because of the text that says that the Holy Spirit came upon Mary, it was a miracle. It wasn't biological. All right? I'm not going to dig too deep into that, um, but that's one of the arguments you will get. Oh, it's a biological impossibility. Science has proven that you have to have two. Jesus had to have a father. There's something else going on. Nope, I'm sorry. It's a virgin birth. Number two, it's exegetically incorrect. There are scholars, liberal scholars, who will tell you, well, the Bible doesn't really teach a virgin birth. Oh, no, I just read a text that says it that does it. Oh, no, no, you have to understand. And uh, they try to make that a later edition that found its way into the text to make Jesus God incarnate. Right. And they'll say, well, there's only and besides, it's not supposed to be in there. Number two, uh, when Matthew quotes, uh, it says, quotes Isaiah, that the virgin would give birth. Well, in the Hebrew, that's not what it says. You know, it doesn't use the technical word for virgin. It uses the uh, the less te the, the more technical wor word for young woman. And actually, that's that's error. That's not true. Um, there's actually three words, and I'm just going to give you the English because I'm, I don't know how to speak Hebrew. So there's a word for virgin, the technical word, the specific word for virgin. There is a word that means young woman. Just means a young woman of a marriageable age. It doesn't mean she's a virgin or non virgin. It doesn't say anything about that. And then there's another one uh, that just basically means young maiden. Which has a strong uh, sense of, you know, uh, of virginity, and uh, so virgin could be somebody who's sixty, or it could be somebody who's, you know, sixteen. Um, it doesn't qualify, but a maiden is the idea of a young virgin, and so Isaiah seven fourteen does in fact say young virgin, and um, so uh, well that throws that argument out of the water, right? And uh, those are my answers. Those I'm giving you easier answers than that. Uh, but then I say, well, it's only it's only talked about in two places. Paul never talks about it, uh, John never brings it up, uh, Mark never brings it up, James never brings it up, the Hebrew writer never brings it up, nobody brings it up except for these two people, and so they just, it was later edition, so blah, 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 so they give you all these answers, is it exegetical and possibly, no, it's in there, right, you have to deal with it, it's a part of the original text, we know that, and so you're going to get that kind of an answer, and I promise you, I'm going to give you three answers that are real easy to t take care of these, but the third argument we've got to get through is mythic parallels. Don't the Greeks have all kind of, you know, ideas of uh, people having these half-gods and demigods and you know, virgin births happening all over the place throughout history? Yeah, Greek poets wrote all kind of stuff like that. But there's a difference. Greek poets were writing poetry. The Gospels are recording history. There's a massive difference. A Hebrew would not ever try to record sacred literature uh, that has been revealed from God in the same way that a Greek like Homer writing the Iliad or, you know, um, I can't think of any of their other names right now. Uh, but you have Ovid and you have all these different writers writing. And no, they were writing figuratively. They were writing poetry. And the Bible is recording history. Massive, massive category errors. And it doesn't matter the fact that there were precursors to this account. I like what C.S. Lewis says. He says, look. He says, of course, God's going to do it that way. If he did things we didn't understand or we didn't, you know, we could understand it. Right. God does things in, in analogies and in symbols and in figurative language and different things. He reveals to us in ways that we understand. If it wasn't intelligible, if we didn't understand it. So, of course, God was preparing the world for Jesus by giving all these stories through all, you know, all these different religions and all these different poetries and all these different writers God was preparing the world for Christ. So that when it came, we would say, oh, this is what God has been doing all along. And so we wouldn't miss it. Uh, so here are my three simple answers that you can give to anybody who asks those kind of ridiculous questions or have those kind of arguments. Number one, if there is a God, miracles are possible. It borders on sheer stupidity. To say, well, no, you know, yeah, I believe in God, but there's no such thing as a virgin birth. Why? <laughs> if there's a God, he can do anything he wants. 
If he wants to put all the animals on a boat, if he wants to stop the sun when somebody prays, if he wants to stop the rain, if he wants to part the sea, that's his prerogative. He can do as he pleases. So I would even go further to say that not only are miracles possible, they're probable. If God cares, if God's intervened, if God you know, cares about this world at all, of course he's going to intervene. Of course he's going to get involved. Of course he's going to do things. And so a virgin birth really isn't that surprising. Right? If there's a God, you can't say, well, this is what he would do. This is what he won't do. Do you realize, have, have, how many of you have ever read um, Darwin's On the Origin of Species? Any of you? Over and over and over again, he constantly says, well, God wouldn't do it that way. A God wouldn't do it that way. Well, God wouldn't do it this way. And so he's constantly, what he's doing, he's constantly criticizing what God would or would not do in that book. And so that it's not even really a scientific treatise, because science cannot prove or disprove God. All it is is he has arguments. He doesn't want to believe in God, and he's trying to find verified, you know, reasoning to not believe in God. Okay? When a simple fact is, if there is a God, God can do whatever he pleases. And whatever he pleases will get done. And so what they're really questioning is they don't believe there's a God who works miracles. That's the, that's, that really ends all arguments. There is a God in heaven who took a young virgin between the year, years of 13 and 15 and he overshadowed her. And you have to understand the Old Testament symbolism. This is the Shekinah glory. The glory that went with Israel as they journeyed through the wilderness. They had a pillar of fire by night. They had a cloud by day. That was the Shekinah glory. That was the presence of God. In a physical form, they could understand. It's called a theophany. And so it led Israel. It gave them light at night. It gave them, you know, chained them from the sun during the day. Whenever they had the, the tabernacle, the Shekinah glory of God came and fell upon that place. And everybody was afraid. Remember when up on, the, on Mount Sinai, there was lightnings and there was thunderings. There was a cloud and there was fire. And there was all this stuff occurring. That was the presence of God in that place. In a form they could fathom, the form they could understand. Right? And then the scripture writers tell us that when Jesus came, he tabernacled amongst us. It's talking about that kind of glory again. He came, he took on flesh, he dressed up, he was here, he dwelt, he was here with us. And so that idea of the Holy Spirit coming down is the Shekinah glory resting upon Mary. And so if God wants to take a young girl and give her a child of his own in that way, that's his prerogative, that's his choice, he can do it. Who's to question that? That is ridiculous. That is ridiculous. If you allow room for a God, he can do as he pleases. That is his desire, his, whatever he wants. So the question really revolves around, do miracles exist? Now, number two, now this is just something I'm just throwing out there too. You don't even have to go any further than that with those people. Because once you realize that's all you need, and it's not feasible to put limits on God, um, you, you show how illogical it is, it just shuts them up. Usually you'll get, I never thought about that. Yeah. <laughs> and it's simple. So there you go. If God exists, miracles are not only possible, they're probable. Um, but uh, number two, the nature of unique events in history. We have that occur all the time. Unique events in history. The American Revolutionary War only happened one time. We can't examine it the same way we can examine how fruit grows, right? Because we always have fruit continuing to grow and grow. And, you know, we can take it and examine it. And if we screw something up here, well, we can go back because there's more oranges growing and we can see how that works. The American uh, Revolutionary War happened one time. It didn't happen again. So we only know what was recorded back then. It's a historical event, right? And the nature of historical events are a lot of times we only have unique one, you know, unique one time unrepeatable. You can't repeat it. And so the virgin birth of Jesus was a unique event. It happened one time. It occurred in history. It wasn't, you know, it, so it's not the object of scientific investigation. It's the object of historical investigation. And uh, the third thing is the reliability of the Bible. Really what people are questioning is the, is the Bible true? Is the Bible reliable? And yes, it is. It's funny because it passes all the historical tests, every single one of them. We have more reason to believe the Bible than we do any other ancient document in history. Homer, the book, the, the Homer's uh, Iliad, that is the most well-attested ancient document that we have, right? And uh, we only have 
something like 60 copies of it. The New Testament alone, we have over 5,000 copies of the manuscripts so that we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is the Bible that we, we have received from the apostles. Right? This is the Bible that was inspired. This is the Bible that was recorded. This is the Bible that was handed down throughout the years. We know that for a fact. We know that by all historical fact. You know, all historical investigation. We have more reason to trust the Bible than we do Homer's Iliad. We have more reason to trust the Bible than we do the American Constitution. Right? It is amazing. We have, we have more information, historical information about Jesus Christ, both sacred and secular, than we do about Caesar. Any of the Caesars. We have more information about Jesus. They wrote more about him then, in the secular literature, than they did about Caesar. Isn't that something? So how reliable? Well, yeah, the Bible is completely reliable. <laughs> There's no question. We could go for a long time and there's all kinds of facts and figures, but this is a, that's not my point here this morning. It's just that the virgin birth is difficult for all people. Why? Because it's not something that we accept with our heads. We accept it with our hearts. It is factual. It is historical. And God has done it. Right? There's no question about it. But it's a matter of faith. Why? Because even for Mary... When she's confronted with this idea, what do we do with the virgin birth? She's like, well, what do you mean I'm going to be pregnant? That's going to be a little hard, Gabriel. I, I, I haven't been with a man. I can't have a baby. Uh, no, right? People talk about the Old Testament, I mean, the, the Old Testament, New Testament writers as if they were like superstitious primitives. But yeah, they were smart enough to know that a virgin can't have a baby. Now, how's this going to be so? I haven't known a man. The glory of God is going to come. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. You will have a baby. Which moves me to, um, so the virgin birth is something we absolutely affirm. And I'll come back to the virgin birth in a moment. Um, Mary and our response to the incarnation. Now we have a Protestant reaction to Mary, don't we? You will rarely hear sermons on Mary and how wonderful Mary is. Because of our Protestant re allergic reaction to Mary being talked about. Why? Because of the excesses and the idolatry of the Catholic Church. Right? I love Catholics. But there's so much in their, what they believe that is downright heretical. Contrary to scripture. And you cannot be saved if you accept their doctrine. All the good Catholics that I know that are saved are saved in spite of their religion. Not because of it. Okay? And I say that with a heavy heart. I don't say that as a critical person. Go read the Council of Trent and their documents and what they believe salvation is. It can't be called the Christian faith at all. Okay? But one of the heresies that they introduced was Mary is the queen of heaven. Right? She is a co-matrix with Jesus. So Jesus isn't the only mediator. He's just one of two. Prayers are offered to Mary. And it goes on and on and on. This is dogma in their church. You have to accept it or you're not a Catholic. You know, you have to accept their doctrine and it's not. But we err in the other way. Very few books are written about Mary, but you see a little bit more and more being introduced now. But Mary, as far as I'm concerned, is a hero in the faith. Right? Mary is, she's a, a, a hero of the faith that all of us can learn lessons from and all of us can imitate this woman. She is a giant in the faith. I know that somewhere in her life there was sin, but we don't see it anywhere in Scripture. An angel comes to her and says, you're going to give birth to the Messiah. You're going to have, she says, that's going to be a little hard. I don't know a man. He says, that's okay. We're going to help with that. She, what does she say? May it be done to me. May it be done to me as you say. I'm the Lord's handmaid. No question, no, no hesitation, no doubting. Look at her male counterparts most of the time. He, God has to come into Joseph in a dream a number of times, right? How many times Gideon had to go out and fleece God? Well, Lord, just make the fleece wet and not the ground around it, okay? And the next day, well, God, don't be angry with me. You, know, you don't see that in Mary. Moses saw God, could you pick somebody else to go deliver Israel? I don't think I can do this. You know, all the milk counterparts don't just come to God and say, okay, here we have Mary saying, may it be to me as you will. 
Do you realize the difference between her and Zechariah? Zechariah, when he questioned, how can this be so? It was a question of doubt. It was a question of doubting God and God's power. And he says, because you doubted, you're going to be silent until the day your son's born. Right? When Mary says, but how can this be so? It's just a question of how is that going to happen? I don't understand. It was, a, it was a, more of a, a humility thing. How, how can this be so? Joseph and I haven't got this taken care of. It's going to be a miracle. It's going to be a unique event. And she says, may it be done. And when you think about the gravity of the situation, um, of what her plight was, um, is Mary consecrated herself to the God she trusted. I wrote even um, somewhere else, maybe, if I look at my notes once in a while. Mary is an example of entire consecration, devotion, and sanctification. If anybody is a model of... Just being all in on God's program. Just saying, God, whatever you want, whatever you desire. Just being totally unreserved. Un, just abandoned to God and His purposes. It was Mary. Because Mary, you must understand, remember. Mary would be considered either, number one, she had an adulterous affair. Right? Because she'd be pregnant before, uh, her, before uh, you know, the nine months after Joseph and her would have been married and would have had a baby. Jesus could be born a lot earlier than nine months. And people would say, that's a little big for a uh, preemie. So he's going to be born early, so there's going to be all kind of stigma attached to her. She could have been publicly executed. Because for her to commit adultery was a capital offense, according to the Old Testament faith which she was an adherent to, an Old Testament faith. She could have, she could have been public, publicly executed. How is Joseph going to understand? Joseph, I'm pregnant. There's a problem. Back to that biological impossibility thing. It takes two of us. So there was that problem. There was also the problem was, if her and Joseph went ahead with God's plan, guess what? Jesus was going to be an illegitimate child in the eyes of all the public. Because Joseph and Mary, they had marital relations before they were ever married. And so stigma would follow them both around for all their days. Did you ever notice the slams they would give to Jesus? Right? Jesus said, you know, to the Jews in, in the Gospel of John, he said, hey, you know, whoever sins is a slave to, you know, is a slave to sin and all those things. And, he, you know, he says, you're, you're like your father. Uh, and they're like, we're not illegitimate children. It was a slam to Jesus. So, yeah, we're not, you know, we, we, were, we were born pure, not like your parents who couldn't wait and disobeyed God. She could have been executed. Definitely stigma was going to follow her around. But then you have Simeon uh, and what Simeon says to her, right? Uh, Jesus is born. Uh, Jesus is presented at the temple. Um, and you have this uh, Simeon. Uh, this this wonderful old te- this old wonderful Old Testament saint who God said before you die you will see my deliverer and he sees Jesus and he holds him up I don't know this is my crazy way of seeing things I, I just picture like on uh, uh, the Lion King <laughs> when Rafiki's holding Simba up on the thing like <laughs> I just picture Simeon just looking up into these. You know, big dark eyes and saying, oh, God, you've made the, the, let your servant depart in peace for I have seen your deliverer. He's holding God in his hands. Think about that. He's holding him and he says to Mary, he's going to be the cause of the rise and fall of many. But he's going to be a sword that pierces your own heart too. All that cost Mary in having this baby in her obedience and her faith to God. There's a reason why we should admire her and adore her and love her and seek to imitate her. Entirely selfless, completely abandoned to God. She loved and desired God and his plan more than anything. She wasn't worried about self-preservation. She wasn't worried about any of that. I'm glad we're in a denomination that honors women. I know many uh, just wonderful Bible teachers and stuff that are women. Uh, Lois Moranville is awesome. I love her dearly. She's one of the godliest people that I know. One of the toughest people I know too. <laughs> but the reason that I'm, we've, our, we have a tradition that's always seen, that God, you know, recognized what God does in women is just as valid as what God does in men. There's a lot of denominations and churches that are not that way. 
They still treat women like second-class citizens. I think so often, wow, look at Mary, right? Look at her cousin Elizabeth. Look at the Bora, you know, or Deborah, uh, how do you pronounce her name, the Old Testament. The male leader come up to her and she's like, you better lead because God's going to give you deliverance. But you, he's, I, only, I only go if you go. And she's like, all right. But if I go, you're going to lose the... You're going to lose all the glory. The glory is going to go to a woman. And then you have the lady who drives a tent peg through the man's, through the king's skull. And the scripture remembers that she got the victory, not the king, not the guy. <laughs> I just think God has a wonderful sense of humor sometimes. Right? But women, people, Protestants are becoming more and more welcome to receiving Mary as a wonderful example of a godly saint, of someone we should seek to be like. What a wonderful, the Virgin Mary, the mother of Jesus. Um, I think we need to spend more time just reading and studying and learning and devoting ourselves to being like her and using her as an example of faith. So the big thing here uh, that I want to end with is just this. The incarnation is a twofold promise. When we talk about virgin birth, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about incarnation. We're not talking about how God had to you know, somehow have someone born who would be sinlessly perfect. And No, we're talking about God being born in the flesh. Uh, if you go to Matthew uh, chapter 1, uh, I love the fact, um, I love the humanness of the scriptures. They struggle, they doubt, they fear, they're, you know, they, it covers the whole gamut of, of human experience, right? And so it's, it begins, this is the, how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had a mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Uh, just let's stop there for a second, uh, because... Um, God's given him personal revelation to Joseph. So Joseph, he's, calling, he's catching Joseph up into God's plans. Joseph, just as Mary has been chosen to be my son's mother, I have chosen you to be the adoptive son, or to be the adoptive father of my son. Think about that. Joseph had a privileged position. I get to be his dad. I might not be his real dad, but I get to be the Messiah's father. I get to help him grow. I get to help him mature. I get to teach him carpentry. Like one of the first things I thought when I had a kid was I get to teach him fishing. I get to teach him hunting. I get to share them with you know my children, my love for books. I get to do all kinds of things with my kids. Um, they all got BB guns, so we're all you know all shooting and stuff. And the girls got muddy girl camo ones, and Lucas got a camo one. And you know you just think about all the things you get to teach, and he's like, I get to do this with the Messiah. We've got to watch how divine we make Jesus. We've got to realize he was very God and very man. He was a 100% both. Jesus, the Jesus that we see, the Jesus that we love, the Jesus that we admire, was the composite uh, picture of not only the fact that he was divine, but he's also Joseph and Mary's boy. His personality came from Mary and Joseph. His love for God and the things of God, that came from Mary and Joseph. They taught him, they instructed him. They helped him along. At some point, yes, divine wisdom began to pour into that man because at 12 he was instructing uh, the leaders of Israel. But the fact that he was still Joseph and Mary's boy. So Joseph, but you know, the, the apprehension that Joseph may have, well, is he, he's not really my son. And, you know, she will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus. Not Mary. Whoops. Not Mary, but you will give him the name Jesus. And why? Because in Hebrew literature, when you gave the name to something, you owned that thing. You possessed that thing. It was yours. He's like, I want you to take, this is your boy. Don't hold him out at arm's length. Don't treat him as if he's an adopted child or a stepchild. You take that boy and you embrace him as your own. And Joseph did. You give him the name 
Jesus. For his pe- he will save his people from their sins. His name is his calling. His name is his mission. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. The virgin birth, the conception by the Holy Spirit, is the promise of God for us and God with us, Emmanuel. This should be sweetness to our ears, sweetness to our hearts. It should just make us love God even more. Why? Right? Uh, John Wesley, one of my favorite things about him, one of the last things he said, it wasn't the final thing that he said, but the next to the last thing that he said, he kept repeating, the best of all is God is with us. The best of all is God is with us. Emmanuel was a special name for God on the lips of John and on the hearts of John Wesley. He loved to call God his Emmanuel. A lot of his, the hymns that he wrote was Emmanuel and God with us. He would write over and over throughout his hymns. He loved to sing it. He loved to praise it. He loved it. And it was one of the final things on his mind as he was dying and going on to glory. Why? Because that is a ble- the blessed hope that we all have. If God was so transcendent that he wasn't near, how can we know he ever care? Right? We went over this a few weeks ago. The doctrine of trans- transcendence and imminence. Right? If God, yes, God is all powerful, God is holy, God is on a throne, but God could hold us off at a distance and say, I really don't care. Yeah, I can affect things, I can change things, but how do we know He cares? But if God is too human and too, He's too imminent, then oh, He could be mushy and gushy, but if He's not all powerful, what good is it? The doctrine of the incarnation is God is both near and God is, you know, both capable, but it's that God is for us and God is with us, right? God came, he put on flesh. Uh, In Philippians, you know, it says that Jesus didn't try to hold on to his divinity. He gave it up, right? He gave up his glory. He gave up his, all the claims that he could have laid hold of, all the things he chose to instead embrace a, a human life. To suffer and die for you and I. He couldn't have done that apart from his incarnation, apart from becoming flesh. And it required a virgin birth. So we should praise God every Christmas and throughout the year for the wonderful virgin who said yes to God's plan. It was going to be difficult. It was going to be. But she said yes. So what should our response be? Praising God that he's for us. He's with us. And responding in the same way Mary did. Here I am. And gentlemen, you don't have to call yourself a handmaid of the Lord, but a servant of the Lord. (laughs) Here I am, a servant of the Lord. Do with me as you please, Lord. Because her faith was in the God that she trusts. The best of all is God is with us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for the opportunity uh, to, again, these are just refresher courses for many of us. Maybe for some of us, this is new. We never, things we never thought about before. But these are the core cardinal doctrines of the faith. This is what makes us Christian. The Apostles' Creed and our acceptance of it in the early ecumenical creeds. It is apostolic faith. It is, what the, it is the truth that we are to defend with all that we have. Uh, as it says in Jude, we are raised up for this purpose, to defend the faith that has once been delivered to us. There's in a sense, Lord, where every Sunday, nothing's going to be new. Because it's the same old truth. And that's how we know it's biblical. If it's a new truth, it's probably heresy. Because there is no new truth. But there is fuller revelation, Lord, of the old truths. And that's what we're praying for. That's what we're seeking. That's what we're, We just want to go deeper with you, God, in our faith, in our understanding, in our love and devotion and desire for you. Who would have ever thought of virgin birth? But Lord, we are thankful this morning that God came. Came from heaven to earth. Then from the earth to the cross. From the cross to the grave. And then powerfully resurrected. It took a man to atone for our it, it took a man uh, to be the sacrifice. It took a man who was more than man to accomplish what he did at Calvary. And Lord, we are thankful for our Emmanuel today. Help us hold on to that truth that God is for us and God is with us. And help us to respond the same way Mary did, Lord. Here I am. Lord, we pray that you uh, just minister to us this week. 
uh, be with us in discipleship. We pray that we would go deeper and we would just oh, experience more intimacy and deeper devotion and um, deeper love for God and deeper love for one another. We pray that you would fill the discipleship group with hungry, seeking people who are just desirous to go deeper with Jesus. And we pray that you lead it all. Uh, Father, we just thank you for the Lord Day today, and we just give you all the praise and all the glory. It's in Christ's name we ask it, and all of God's people said, Oh, geez, I am knocking everything down today.